uh, Christian and his Mongo man. All right. So, as you can tell, I'm definitely not on the design side of uh, software. I'm definitely more on the development side. And I'm going to present like Mongo Man, which I know is incredibly offensive for the most of the world, if you're not obviously American. And uh, even if I work with Tengen, like I've, we've had a discussion about like how MongoDB ended up being called MongoDB, and uh, it seems to be because of the word humongous, and nobody checked the, dire, uh, you know, the dictionary for what it actually means in most other countries. But that's the history. So who am I? I wrote the Node.js driver for MongoDB, and I started with Node.js for about version two, uh, 0.1 or something like that, and uh, have been using Node uh, since then. I work for Tengen, the MongoDB company, and based in Barcelona, and also run the MongoDB user group in Barcelona. Um, so if you're interested and you live in Barcelona, you come on by, we usually arrange something every month, with the exception of August, because we're on vacation. Uh, and if you're interested in general about maybe starting a group in, in Madrid or something like that, just talk to me. And don't be shy, I don't bite much. So, why Pac-Man? Nostalgia, really. Like, I'm an 80s gamer. I grew up with like the Commodore 64, so when I was uh, planning to make a multiplayer game, I thought, you know, what better thing to do than a typical 80s game? And also because, you know, my graphical design skills are not very good. So I looked at Pac-Man, and I was like, there's like this massive timeline of Pac-Man games that I'd never heard of, right? And uh, I was looking around, and I was like, well, you know, after going through every single variation and looking at different stuff, there's even like a virtual reality Pac-Man with like headsets and stuff like that. Uh, I just said, like, oh, let's go back to original stuff, right? So we're looking at the 1980s uh, Pac-Man, right? And uh, here's mine. It's kind of crappy. I think it was actually better in uh, 1980 than what I managed in 2012. Now, small rant, just in general, about HTML5. So if you look at the 1980s, my favorite time of like computers, because you turn them on and they actually did something without having to install anything. The graphics were kind of, you know, crap, but feasible. Mario and this kind of stuff. We go into the 90s, you start getting 3D graphics, you know, you've got Tomb Raider and Doom, and you have like 3D FX, the famous company that went bankrupt. You wander into the 2000s, you're starting to get like, you know, Skyrim and like Far, uh, Far Cry and, and all kinds of stuff, like crazy setups with multiple graphics cores and stuff like that. And the future looks something like that, right? It's like the tech demos they're showing us now, and it's what you're going to be playing like, I don't know, in five years or something. So. HTML state of games is 1980-ish. It's like something went wrong somewhere, right? And, uh, you know, before you scream like, oh, but you got WebGL and stuff like that, I well, remember, WebGL is not a standard, all right? So, although you, it's out there and you can use it in Chrome, in Firefox, uh, now in Opera, and uh, also in uh, Safari, you've got to remember that's like, this is never going to happen in Microsoft Internet Explorer, right? Ever. Or unless something really radically happens. And, uh, you know, you, you read all these great games like uh, Bastion that you can play in Chrome and stuff like that. It's all using N uh, native client, which is also another standard, right? So if you're going to write a high intensive game using 3D and you want to use a standard, you can't really do WebGL unless you're happy with just supporting Chrome and Firefox. Uh, and then you basically can't use a native client because that's literally only Chrome. So you're stuck with Flash. And that's the reality of it if you could do 3D games, right? And if you look at the other libraries that we have out there that are kind of like uh, 2D libraries, and they say, we use WebGL. Yeah, they're using WebGL to accelerate 2D graphics, right? And what happens if you run it on Internet Explorer? Well, you're back to like whatever the canvas can support. So building Mongo Man. A couple of challenges when you build uh, real-time games is latency, right? And when you do it in Node.js, you have to think about how much time you spend in the event loop. Because Node.js is running a single thread, you can spawn multiple processors and use clusters, and we'll show how you can do that. But generally, it just runs in a single thread. So the more time you spend executing core, a code, 
the less time you have to actually deal with incoming requests. So you want to get the data, process it as fast as possible, and then just like handle off to the next request. Process locality is another issue in Node.js. Um, since each process is pretty much isolated, if you want the process to communicate with each other, you either have to build your own uh, layer or uh, fudge something. There, there is like a little bit of discussion around doing IPC, uh, inter-process communication. I remember Orion was looking at that a couple, well, a year ago or something like that. I don't know exactly what came out of it. Right now, you use standard out and standard error to like talk between processes, or you build an additional layer, or use something like Redis or Mongo or Memcache or something to just sync between the processes. So checking settings is another important thing when it comes to optimizing your game because um, you have stuff like idle garbage collection in V8, uh, socket node delay, and also like making sure you don't uh, do as you, you want to do the minimum amount of garbage collection while you're running your game. So Mango Man. Mango Man's architecture is fairly simple. I'm using a, a library called Akibara, which is uh, made by a guy who is really into like old ga style games, and it's a very, very simple to use game if you want to do the typical 80s style game. I'm using SoundJS as a library. I think it's from Adobe or something like that, like the whole suite, great suite. Um, it lets you, you know, take care of a lot of the, the nitty gritty of dealing with sound. On the server, there's no JS. Express JS is to handle a couple of web pages. I use the WebSocket and MongoDB, and I'll tell you why I use MongoDB later, and it's really for one core functionality. So technology. As I said, Node.js, Akibara, MongoDB. I did use the WebSocket NPM instead of the Socket.io because Socket.io is very slow. Right? So Socket.io basically layers another uh, protocol on top of WebSocket and then handles all the fallback, that kind of stuff. So I just said, like, I'm not going to support anything that doesn't have WebSockets. So because it's a demo, I'm not making money off this game, obviously. So I just dropped that and used uh, the WebSocket NPM package, which is a pure WebSocket implementation. Um, and for Mongo, I use something called Cap Collections, and uh, specifically a uh, kind of um, uh, operation called Find the Modify, which I'll tell you a little bit about. So Akibara basically uses a simple 2D game engine where you basically add objects to a play field and those objects can, inter uh, can basically uh, handle stuff like collision detection, all that kind of nitty gritty that you don't want to deal with. Uh, it's very simple. There's a really good example, which happens to be close to the Mongo Man uh, modified. And there's, uh, well, it uses Canvas with no acceleration other than what's actually in Canvas itself, but it's plenty good enough for this kind of game, right? We're not looking at 3D rendering or anything like that. WebSocket implementation. Basically, it's really fast, it, but it has no fallback uh, compatibility at all. And it does support binary frames, but there's so few uh, actual browsers that do that right now. The latest Chrome and the latest Firefox, I think it's like 14 now. It seems to be changing every week, the model, uh, the, the version of uh, Firefox these days. But um, I was using that initially in an earlier version. I dropped it because I just couldn't make it work. And um, binary frames just definitely don't work for uh, iOS devices as of now, but I don't know if iOS 6 will fix that. So, sound just mixes audio. Anybody who's tried to make a game without using uh, a library like SoundJS for handling audio knows that doing audio on the browser is horrible. Like, it, it is like, I mean, it makes uh, your old spectrum look like a piece of art, you know, technological high-end uh, music equipment compared to what you get in a browser. Latency is horrible, stuff like that. So there's a lot of like libraries that will work around it. I, I basically use SoundJS because it kind of lets you very simply just like mix multiple different sounds without having to deal with or knowing what's going on underneath. It will try to pick the best way of playing that sound depending on the browser that's there. Mongo cap collections. So how many here have used Mongo or know how, what Mongo is? Wow, that's a lot. Right, so in uh, Mongo, uh, tables are called collections, right? And a collection is just a bunch of documents. So if you have a special type of collection called a cap collection, and a cap collection is basically a FIFO queue, right? So when you put a document in, and if there's no more space, the last document you put in falls off the queue. 
So a benefit is uh, that it limits the exposure to memory. Uh, and like when you deal with like databases, and I spend too much time there about around MongoDB, you always talk about like documents moving around the memory, right? So when a document is too big uh, for the space that it's uh, allocated, you have to copy it somewhere on the memory. But in cap collection, that doesn't happen. That means that the, the amount of time it takes to write to a document is fixed. And you basically support indexes as well, and it's tailable. Like, so you can actually do like a TLF like you're used to on uh, Linux uh, on a table, and it, as new records are coming into the table, you basically get a notification. Negatives are documents can't grow. So you have to actually write the biggest size document that you, can ha that you need at the creation of the documents. So Node.js cluster. So everybody who uses Node here, anybody use cluster? Anybody here do Node.js applications at all? Look up cluster like in document because this is how you want to run your application. So you can basically take a, a bunch of child processes and attach it to the same socket. So you're basically load balancing across multiple processes, right? So cluster is just a way of doing that programmatically and it's very simple. And so the way the code is organized is that we have a parent process that runs the game and then we have child processes that answer the gamers. And so if something goes wrong in one of the processes, like say it runs out of memory, the operating system decides to kill it or something, we're able to just like restart a new process without having to uh, write all this extra stuff around it, like God or like managing all these kind of things, right? So it's a very, very simple way of making your application a little bit more fault tolerant. Obviously, if you kill the parents, you kill everything, but at least your ch child processes will survive. It's been in uh, since 0 06, uh, and in 0 08, it's even better. And basically, to create a, a process, is very simple. You just do cluster.fork. That returns you a worker uh, object. And on that object, you can add a, a listeners. And so you can do an on message. And uh, they can actually message each other, right? So you can emit the message to, uh, to your parents, right? So in this case, basically, what we see is that there is a cluster on death. If the process dies, it takes uh, logs, just the what worker and what PID died, and then it just forks another one. So this is perpetual, right? It just keeps going. I had to like work a little bit around the session stuff because uh, there's not really well support of sharing sessions between WebSockets and uh, Express. And I was a bit hacky to get around it, but I ended up using a name cookie. I'm not my proudest moment, but I should probably like fix it. You know, I probably should like figure out what um, WebSocket is doing differently and try to make it work with Express or write like Web, WebSocket Express or something like that. So basically just to handle the grab uh, session stuff, I use uh, the connect npm package, which is part of the Express, but you have to install it separately if you want to use all the nice utilities. It has a couple of things like parse cookie. It just basically takes the headers and like parses out the cookies for you. And I'm basically doing just keeping a cookie with a connection SID and making sure that that cookie is like uh, taken over uh, both connections. Because the thing that happens when you do a WebSocket connection is that it actually also uses your session ID, but it's a separate connection to the server. So you kind of have to tie those two together to make sure that you know which player is actually on this WebSocket. So initializing a board. So as you've taken, uh, as you consider, like what kind of scenarios uh, of Mongo or Pac-Man can we be playing here, right? So I'm going to tell you right now. We're basically a five. It's a five user, uh, five uh, gamers uh, game where one is a ghost, and no, one is Pac-Man, and the other ones are the ghosts, right? So to have a game playing, we want to be able to like pick up a board that's already in play and add ourselves to it, right? So if there is a, a Mongo Man then we want to be sure that there is uh, at least a, a maximum of only one Mongo man and that there should be a maximum of five players, right? So in MongoDB, you have a command called find and modify. And find and modify gives a guarantee that you'll be able to retrieve and modify a document in one operation. 
So in this case, what we're doing is that we're looking for any board, because this is using a table called boards, basically, where the number of players is less than five, and where the PID is the same as the current process we're running in. And the reason we're doing that is that we're making sure that all the five players are playing on the same process, so that there is no additional complexity in having to, like, having two players playing on process one and two, three players on the process two, right? Because we'd have to write all this complicated code to sync those two things. So we're binding, basically, a board to the process. If we find one, it increments the number of players to one, and it pushes uh, the connection ID to the document under an array called players. New equals true means that it returns that document after it's modified it. And if there isn't one in there, it won't try to uh, set it, insert it. So the way modify, find modify works is that if it didn't find the, uh, the document, by default it would try to like insert one. That would basically just be an empty document with number of players and uh, an array with one connection in it. But we're saying no to that because we're actually handling that in the code specifically. So the state machine of a ghost. Now this is like something I found out there, like somebody had uh, done, right? So you got the, the typical AI of uh, ghost, which is a simple um, uh, state machine. You have wanders the maze. If it sees Pac-Man, chase him. And if, uh, if Pac-Man needs a power pill, then you know, run away from Pac-Man. If it doesn't see uh, Pac-Man anymore, then you just go back to like just like walking around, right? So in our game, we're basically just that part. That's you. So it's a lot more simpler. No AI, right? The AI is uh, it's the, the gray matter between the keyboard and the chair. And the way we basically handle is like a message protocol. So the WebSocket is basically sending uh, data back and forth between the client and the game. So in the case of like there's a movement, like you click left on Mongo Man, it sends that movement to the server. The server actually does the check if there is a collision with any ghosts. And if there is, then it sends a ghost dead to all ghosts because they're all animating ghosts, right? But on the ones who are not the ghost, it will, they will see the ghost fly away. And on the, one, the other one that you are, you'll basically die and get uh, put back in the pit. And everything is like set up like that. It's just basically a state machine of uh, messages going back and forth between a client. And the type of messages that we have are stuff like initialize, which is uh, just when the board is set up and you're saying, hey, I'm playing on this board. Yeah, I'm playing on this board and I'm Pac-Man. Oh, I'm the ghost. Dead, which is if Pac-Man dies. Mongo win, which basically is uh, Pac-Man managed to eat the entire board and is done. Ghost dead, if uh, Pac-Man eats the ghost while it's on power pill. Power pill is like Pac-Man is now e has eaten a power pill. And movement is just generally when he's moving around. And that goes for the ghost as well. So current state of affairs is collision detection managed on the server. Pills are not managed on the server right now. They should probably do it. They just didn't have enough time to implement it. Um, probably need to move the whole board to the server so ensure that nobody actually can cheat in any possible way. But at least like collisions are on the server, so you can't just tell, you know, jump Pac-Man from one place to the other by sending uh, a message, right? So premature optimization. We all know that we all want to do it, and it's hard not to, right? So when it comes to uh, MongoDB, a couple of things that we, or, uh, to Mongo Man, a couple of things we did was basically binding all the connections to a specific process, which works great for MongoDB because we're on, oh, sorry, for Mongo Man, because we're only five players, right? But if you're writing your, the next World of Warcraft, you probably need a completely different model. Also, like, we, we have to make sure that garbage collection is well. So there's a special function in uh, B8 that you can run from Node.js called no use idle connection notification, all right? So one of the things that happens in a game is like, like say you got 20,000 players in, right? And uh, you have like this huge object model that you're keeping in memory just to keep the games as close as possible. So you don't want to talk to a database all the time, obviously. You just want to talk inside of the process and check the state. So no use idle notification. If you don't use this, 
V8 will wake up once in a while and decide it's time to check where all the objects are and if they're collectible or not, right? And the more objects you have, the longer it will take. And it's a stop the world thing, right? So when it decides, like, I need to check your 1 million objects, maybe you get a pause of 200 milliseconds or 250 or 300 milliseconds, right? That's going to cost you massively and your game is going to stutter. So definitely make sure that you look at this option. It's also very applicable if you're trying to scale your node application up to hundreds of thousands of simultaneous connections because you have to keep those connections around and the more connections you keep around the more this uh, idle garbage collection loop will like uh, punish your application. So another thing you want to do is like make sure that on your socket connections uh, you use no delay true so when you are pushing data out a TCP connection, if you have no delay set to false, it will basically pile up as many messages as it can to fit in a packet and then send it, which means that in a game, it's going to stutter. You know? If there's not enough uh, messages going through, it's going to wait and then like eventually send the packet. So no delay will basically fire messages as soon as they arrive. So it will be lots of small packets instead of like larger, more seldom packages. This is luckily set to default by uh, Node, but always keep an eye on it, especially if you have to do your own socket stuff. There's also in the MongoDB parser, uh, there's a C++ parser. There's a reason why it's beneficial to use the C++ parser for uh, high la or low latency situations. So when you're using the Node.js library uh, for MongoDB and you install it, you're going to be using the JavaScript parser. But you can actually pass a comment to it and it will try to build the native extension. And if you use the native extension, you're just doing a single allocation of memory. So for the duration of the parsing of the document, you're allocating one p chunk of memory and then you're basically returning that and nothing more. If you use the JavaScript one, you're going to be allocating pieces of memory. Although like I've optimized like crazy the J JavaScript thing and it's close to native performance, there are some scenarios where it might be a little bit slower. But these kind of like rules are general uh, for any JavaScript development that you're doing, especially in modern browsers. Understanding like what happens with memory it's really important. Slightly faster as well. I'm waiting for like a patch from an undisclosed company. Uh, we're trying to work out the legal papers, but they have it in production in a massively multiplayer game and they've sped up uh, the C++ code by a lot. So I'm waiting for that to happen. So one of the worst things and you want to, your worst enemies is light speed. So your max resolution in frames per second is 2x the ping time to your server. So if your server is 20 milliseconds away, that means at a maximum of 25 frames per second, like 25 messages per second, right? That's the maximum because the round trip is going to be 40 milliseconds. If it's 135 milliseconds, you're talking about 4 frames per second. It makes the game completely unplayable. So there's a reason why you're not playing on the World of Warcraft servers uh, in Europe, you're playing on the ones in Europe and not the ones in the US. Um, as an example, when we were testing this like a year ago, I think my colleague had like, uh, we had a server on um, Joint and is in North Carolina or something like that. And he had like 10 milliseconds and I had like 200 milliseconds. So of course he was killing me. So a couple of hard lessons. Web sockets are still fresh browsers support binary um, there's actually like and this is in general if you're in a situation where you just want to push data to a client you should look at server events server events is in every single uh, browser as well and it's much more mature than web sockets so it's something you should keep in mind if you need two-way communication with low latency for all means go with web sockets uh, you have to understand memory and CPU at high connection count because Weird things start to happen when you have a lot of connections, like what I said about the garbage collector for V8. You have to avoid process switching as much as possible. So if you're using Node.js and you want to run a game and you got like a modern i7 processor, that's got eight execution threads, right? 
So if you put like 100 processes on there, uh, you're going to spend a lot of time switching between those processes, which means that uh, your Core i7 is going to spend more time than necessary copying memory in and out. So usually I just say a thread per core or per hardware thread. So if you have a Core i7, you probably shouldn't run much more than eight. Remember that like the main thing of Node.js is like it's fast and you should spend as little time as possible in the event loop. So as long as you're actually keeping that uh, Node.js code running inside of the caches of the processor, you're going to get like maximum performance. So generally it's like if you're going to build a game in Spain uh, and you're targeting the Spanish users, put your servers here. If you're targeting for Germany, put them in Germany. You know, put them where your actual uses are. Write a layer that will like, you know, send people to the right IP that's the closest to them. So you get the highest possible throughput. Profile, really important. Make sure you know how much data you're pushing across the wire and like how many connections you have. And also, what's the ping time to the clients? Like, if you can figure that out, you basically have a good way and sense of understanding what kind of uh, uh, experience the user is having, right? You should profile both the browser and the server using available tools. And the Chrome development tools are really great because they let you profile uh, the CPU and the memory usage of your uh, browser code. And if you don't know what I'm talking about, you should definitely look at it. Because this is like one-on-one -on -one when it comes to like debugging a game and getting the most performance out of your code. And collect stats where possible. So what's on the horizon? WebGL is actually coming to iOS. I've, uh, I think uh, it, it was in uh, 05, but it was disabled. I think it's coming like officially in 06, but I'm not completely sure, so don't quote me on it. Um, I know that my playbook, I'm probably the only person in the whole world that has like a RIM playbook, actually has WebGL, which is hilarious because nobody uses it. And then in the next future, I think we can, uh, I think we can use like more like WebGL and, and this kind of stuff in the next two years or so. It depends a little bit on Microsoft. Um, the question is like Internet Explorer, is it ever going to come? I, I don't know. I don't think so. We we'll, might get like DirectX or something like that. So UDP might be coming along. Uh, there's initial support in Chrome. So one of the cool things about UDP, uh, and I think it's uh, really just, uh, anybody here heard about WebRT, like Web Real Time? Some few people. Okay. They're going to build in, or they are already building in like a video conferencing system straight in your uh, browser. Like you can try it uh, with the, if you download the latest Opera, the latest Firefox, you can try it. So to, to do that, they're using UDP. So TCP basically is what we're all used to. That basically has a guarantee that a packet will arrive, right? So when you send you a piece of information, hey, here's goes a piece of information, eventually it will arrive or it'll be resent until it arrives. UDP doesn't have any search guarantee, but it's great for games. Because reality is like if you're playing multiple players at the same time, it doesn't really matter for you if all messages arrive about movement, for example. You just want most of them to arrive. So what's the benefits? You get no waiting for acknowledgments, which means that the amount of time it takes for a packet to arrive to you uh, when it's arriving will actually be fast. And a lower latency. So cons is like you can lose messages. And there's no, uh, you have no idea if the message arrived or not, unless you basically send a message back, say, I got the message, but then you might as well use TCP. And there's no resend, in the sense of automatically taking care of sending the packet if it gets lost. So we're getting to uh, the end and uh, a small demo if uh, this all keeps up. Uh, next project I'm working on is like a tank AI to battle using DCP U16 from uh, Minecraft guys, and so if you want to help, just uh, reach out to me. I'm hoping to have something ready for Lisbon uh, JavaScript. It depends on how much time I have. There's an actual movie. <laughs> this is just coincidence, right? But uh, I've been, uh, I, I think we should uh, adopt him as a mascot, <laughs> because it's awesome. 
And so there's a demo game. Um, you can try it right now. Like there should be a SSD called Mongoman, if uh, anybody sees it. And there's an IP. Uh, you need to go to port 3000. So let's um, can boot it up just to see, uh, show you how it looks. All right, let's have a real quick look here. Oh, not local host. I have to use that P as well. All right. Yeah, no, I know. I suck at uh, web design as well, as you can see. Come on. There you go. Doesn't like my... Oh. Okay, no, I don't want this. All right. So there you go. Anybody managed to connect to the hotspot? Yeah? All right. Oh, there we go. Yeah, so you can see latency is a little bit bad, like because of Wi-Fi, right? But uh, let's see if we can uh, not get eaten by this guy and yeah, yeah. <laughs> All right, so I think it's actually supposed to work on the iPad as well because uh, this little okay, this is another cool thing about this little framework. They actually has like touch event uh, support, so you can like write your little. Uh, let's go here. Let's go eat this. So you can see lat latency is playing against him, right? Yeah, I won. <laughs> so like, as you tell, like, uh, uh, Wi-Fi is pretty horrible for like gaming, right? Uh, there's also a little statistic thing here, and as people connect, I'm just like, showing the number of uh, bytes going through the system. So right now we're doing about 10k. Yeah, so this is just using D3, the really, really nice library. So if you want to graph something real life, just use D3, it's great. Uh, and this is just like a real example of like what you should build for your application when you're using it, all right? So it's all, I'm just grabbing the size of stuff going over, but I should probably have stuff like the ping time and the amount of uh, connections. And this is actually the first time I've been able to pull this off correctly. It's always been a problem. Um, I think that's pretty much it from my perspective. I see, uh, I think there's like a ultimate slide here. Yeah, that's it. You can download the code from GitHub. So just pull it down and play with it. It's very simple to get it running. All you need is MongoDB and uh, Node. And that's it. If there's any questions. <laughs>